Hello everybody, uh, welcome to um, our panel for this afternoon. Uh, we'll be focusing on COVID-19, which is a topic I'm sure is very interesting to everyone, um, and the role of GIS in managing um, what is, a, of course, a global um, public health emergency and, and frankly a disaster. So before we start and before I introduce, I would like to show my respects and acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which UNSW Kensington um, is and of elders past and present. Um, on which this meeting takes place. I'd also, um, uh, so as we move forward, um, I'd like to um, firstly introduce um, our panelists. Um, we've got two um, experienced and, and uh, very well respected researchers in both GIS and epidemiology here with us today. Um, my name is Associate Professor David Heslop. I work with um, uh, one of our panellists at the School of Population Health at the, at the university um, and our two panellists have extensive experience both in COVID-19 but also in GIS mapping of infectious diseases not only of COVID-19 but others. Um, so firstly we have um, I say, uh, sorry, Professor Mary Louise McClaws from the School of Population Health. She's an epidemiologist with expertise in hospital infection and infectious disease control and she's had many COVID-19 related activities this year including as a member of the World Health Organization Health Emergency Program Experts Advisory Panel for Infection, Preven Infection Prevention and Control Preparedness Readiness and Response to COVID-19, <sighs> and uh, a member of the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission COVID Infection Prevention and Control Task Force. She's also the focal point for the WHO GOAN uh, in the School of Population Health. We have had an extensive um, uh, collaboration over the years. I can only speak um, highly. Um, I, I, I could paraphrase her work, but it would take quite a long time to do so. And in the interest of time, I might leave it at that, uh, Mary Louise. But you, you may know Mary Louise from the media. She's been quite prominent um, and influential um, in guiding both government, but also um, public opinion and, uh, and perception of what's been happening here in Australia and overseas. And that's been quite impactful. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Ori Gudis. I hope I've said that correctly. Um, I, excuse me, but um, his expertise is in GIS and health, particularly spatial analysis, decision support systems, and how to develop tools that actually are usable when it comes to uh, when it comes to infectious disease and GIS systems. So he has um, he has actually quite an extensive experience through a variety of um, of research collaborations. Um, uh, my understanding is through. Um, uh, the uh, CRCs in spatial intelligence all the way through to um, a numerous grants um, uh, throughout the years using various different approaches to GIS, both in terms of managing health data, but also more broadly. Um, so um, please welcome um, Ori um, and we'll get on with our panel. Um, we've got a series of questions that we'll be touching on already and we hope to open the floor to some questions from, uh, from those of you attending today as well. Um, but firstly, I'd like to um, open to both of our panellists um, some questions I think that have been important during COVID. Um, so if uh, without further ado, um, to our panellists, um, you know, how do you think GIS capability have assisted public health organisations like the WHO or the Department of Health in managing COVID-19 responses? Thank you, David, and uh, welcome um, viewers. Um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak on this. So uh, first of all, I'd like to remind people that as an epidemiologist in outbreak management as well, um, we have learned from, of course, uh, Snow, uh, John Snow, and he uses spot maps. So some of these supposed um, GIS maps are actually spot maps because they don't really have any, um, they're not underpinned by very complex uh, data that Ori will explain to you um, later on uh, what a really good special analysis does uh, of mapping of diseases. So let me just run through a couple of the maps. And I think regardless of whether they're underpinned by complex analysis, um, they are still really informative and they help the community understand where the risk of COVID is um, and, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the spread, um, uh, the prevalence. So it can be very good and the, and the death. Uh, but there are some better than others. So uh, first of all, there's COVID Live. 
Now they don't use maps, but they certainly have some very good breakdown of Australia for local um, government um, area, uh, metropolitan source, active case, death, recovery, hospitalization, ICU, positive tests, um, that sort of thing. And they're all on tables, but not maps. And they're brilliant, uh, but it's not the same. Uh, then there's um, Johns Hopkins, which you've all seen. Now, I would call them really spot maps. And they give a great visualization, and they were probably one of the first to do this, and Ori would um, be able to correct me if they weren't. Um, but they provide an idea looking at using the bubble, or as um, mappers would call this a spatial uh, location of magnitude of uh, um, cumulative incidents, active cases, uh, incident rate, case fatality and testing but it's it's shallow it's every time you press a button it will show you just that there's no underpinning of importance of the disadvantage of um uh CIFA, you know the socioeconomic um disadvantage um income um age uh, there's nothing that helps to understand why some of these things have big um, blobs and some of them don't. Um, and also there's there's no idea of um, infection by 100,000 or a million population. And then you go to the world a meter and it does. So it doesn't give it to you in the map or even in the spot map, but my goodness, they give you great graphs and they do give it to you by things like per million uh, tested, uh, per million head of population. And it's very good for a quick overview. And you can go into those graphs, have a look at, for example, um, England and find out what their level is today and what it was last week, um, uh, subtract the two and you've got an enormous problem of, I think I did it, and it was about 69,000 cases. And they think that they're at a position to lift some of the restrictions. I think they're slightly disillusioned. Um, so uh, it, you can find lots of things from those graphs, but it is not mapping. Then you've got the Commonwealth of Australia, and um, that provides you with tables, but no maps. And it gives you some very accurate information on states, by state, by deaths, by hospital, by ICU, by tests um, and source, but no mapping. Then, because um, I'm leaving the best to last, then there's WHO and they are spot mappers. They give you cases by bubble so that you can have a look at uh, regional. So there are six regions. There's the uh, Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, the African, the Americas, the Southeast Asian, uh, the Western Pacific and the Americas. And it will give you the growth uh, by day or by week. Uh, so it's very good. And then you can have a look at it as a global map and you can see where some of the problems are, particularly the daily or the weekly ones. But again, it's not underpinned by anything that gives you an idea of disadvantage. Now, you may assume that the Africa is a disadvantage and that some of the Americas are disadvantaged, um, but it doesn't really give you a control for the disadvantage, say, in the UK or in Australia. So then I come to the best one, and that is... University of Sydney. So congratulations, they do a great job because not only do they do a bit like Johns Hopkins, but they provide a relative, um, an index of relative disadvantage, an index of relative advantage and disadvantage, education, uh, economic resources and CIFA. And oh, the proportion of uh, people over 60 with, and so that is, a really nice map and you get a really good idea about um, what the magnitude is according to these important variables that are highly predictive of COVID. So um, now I've given you my idea of, of what I think 
GIS or mapping mm-hmm. is. Um, I'll, I'll give, hand over to my colleague, Ori, who as a mapper uh, will follow up. Thanks, Ori. All right, so uh, hopefully you can hear me clearly and thanks uh, for the SSI and David and, um, to invite me today to speak. Uh, just let me know that you can hear me clearly. And I just wanna add and say and probably reinforce some of the things that uh, Professor Mary Louise said is, um, I guess in any GIS course, the first map and the very well known or the popular is really uh, the presentation of John Snow. So in GIS and health, uh, you know, health was probably the first where, you know, the top law of geography, first law of geography was used. However, only in the last maybe five or 10 years, it become much more uh, popular to, to the use in, in, in the public health context. Now, to take the things that Mary Louise said and maybe make them a bit more specific, uh, Mary Louise is right by saying that, you know, a lot of the analysis, a lot of the GIS um, application that we can see out there, maybe excluding University of Sydney dashboard, are very much in the descriptive level of analysis. And, and I think that is, in a way, a miss of opportunity. And I was just going to support what I'm saying now. Uh, so there's so much potential that to, to develop this further, and I will just give a few examples. Uh, so for, in, for instance, uh, uh, things like identifying community risk. And I think in this example, uh, University of D- Sydney uh, dashboard has done good example by cross-tabulating uh, different layer and uh, presenting the end user where is the risk uh, versus uh, the rate of uh, COVID-19 incidents. If I go to other ex- practical examples, I would say uh, model the spread of disease, which I haven't seen this uh, well developed uh, in Australia. There are a couple of good examples in the United States. Uh, another practical example will be analyzed prediction of hospital uh, capacity. Uh, a very well-known example for that will be the CAMS model, uh, which was uh, originally came in Penn State in Pennsylvania. Uh, so that's a model that was focusing about when hospital will reach uh, their capacity and how we can then lo- allocate or reallocate uh, the 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 force in hospitals uh, against the number of people hospitalized. Some other example will be community contact tracing, and uh, in that topic, a lot of apps were used, and and I think maybe to some degree it was. Uh, used quite successfully in places like in um, um, in Southeast Asia, like Taiwan, uh, maybe to some degree in uh, South Korea, uh, maybe to less degree in, in Australia. Um, I guess location optimization is very, very important topic looking uh, forward of where we are now, uh, because uh, we, we just heard a few days ago that the UK approved the, um, going on the green light for the vaccine. Uh, by Pfizer, and I guess it would be very important uh, for distribution purpose to know where uh, where to put all these distribution centers because the vaccine requires uh, cold, I think minus 70 degrees, uh, to have appropriate uh, storage. Uh, so location optimization is another topic which I would really want to see this going forward. I guess a couple of other things uh, in my list will be mobility analysis. We all seen the reports coming out uh, from Google uh, and as well as from Apple, how much the mobility reduced during the lockdown? What does that mean for active travel, for instance? Um, we all seen these pop-up plans coming out in Sydney CBD, which is obviously a very welcome. To those of you who may have visited Centennial Park uh, during the uh, pandemic, during the lockdown, Centennial Park was closed to car. Uh, what does that mean for, you know, for us going forward uh, post the pandemic? Uh, what will active travel will look like? I think it's really, really interesting question. Uh, and another tool in my list is really measure access to open space and parks. Uh, in that example, I would definitely go to Melbourne uh, because Melbourne were in about two weeks lockdown and uh, essentially the people were restricted to go out only about five days. There was really, very great work by Professor Elizabeth Kendall and others who actually measured um, whether there's an equity or non-equity in terms of access to parks. And this is really important because that can bring also other uh, mental issues or any other stressors. The last item in my list is really uh, measure and avoiding uh, crowdness. And maybe to just to support that, 
Uh, I've seen some a couple of uh, interesting and exciting startups in these new ecosystems of uh, pandemic, where they were trying to predict how crowded a place will be, like a supermarket, how crowded it will be, and therefore support people. You know, people can actually understand. Uh, uh, is it actually worth it to go out now to the supermarket? Maybe I will wait until late at night. So all of these, I think, are uh, opportunities that GIS can really quite well uh, support in terms of spatial analysis and in, in, also in terms of embed this within uh, dashboard and cloud-based solutions. That's that's my training sense. <laughs> Thank you. Can I can I add something? Uh, so one of your um, guests has sent uh, a link to the to the Western Australian COVID dashboard. And I've just been looking through it and it's really lovely. Um, so it gives uh, an idea of confirmed cases, uh, the possible onset of illness, um, whether or not they have had close contacts, uh, the spread, and even where there are clinics. So it is a very nice one. It's not underpinned by um, analysis of spread, by a disadvantage or a culled population uh, to explain the spread, but it's a great um, visual presentation. And that's what the public really need, uh, that great visualization. Thank you, Mary Louise. Um, and um, so we've, we've also had another question from our um, uh, from our group, but we'll come back to that at the end. And I promise we'll have at least five minutes to answer the question. But um, for our panelists, um, and back to you, Mary Louise, um, acknowledging the benefits and all of the different things that can be done with GIS um, and that we've seen with COVID that have been helpful, as you've mentioned, um, that um, aggregation of data. What do you see as some of the pitfalls associated with GIS and infectious disease management? For example, you know, information overload or or being unable to um, develop a, an understanding or situational awareness um, easily. Yes, thank you, David. Um, I think that Ori uh, nicely um, located this problem already by saying that uh, we don't know if we're you know, somebody in, you know, downtown Randwick at the university wanting to know if we want to go for a walk or go shopping, uh, how crowded it is at the time or uh, what to expect. So these things could be more um, real time and also more helpful. Um, and uh, certainly they need to be not just on your computer, but uh, app app wise for the average person who, and I've been pushing this from the beginning, but it must be too difficult to do. Uh, to have a look at um, AS1 or AS2 or even AS3 uh, locators uh, so that when you step outside the university, uh, you know um, what the endemicity is in your area. Um, people are stopping wearing uh, masks now. Uh, they're getting, you know, quite... Um, uh, happy about where Australia is in terms of risk, um, but not understanding that the risk just doesn't go away. It's just that sometimes we don't find cases. Um, so I think the problem is it's not specific for the user. Uh, it's great for us, but often not for the user. But there's also a problem that um, Ori will pick up on, and that is um, the, the tension between privacy and so how close you can get that granularity of data. And I'd love it as granular as possible, as you know, so that we can actually identify much better location than just a local government area. Because uh, I think that would really bring home risk uh, to the community. You don't want to tell them all the time that they're at risk. Uh, they, they get fatigued with bad news, but if they open up and, and they go, well, I might not be at risk, but it then says, but please wear your mask when you're going into a bus or something. Um, the other thing is, of course, is accessibility of data. Uh, it is nigh impossible, uh, unless you work for the Department of Health, to get the data that you need to bring it together to, to have a locator, um, age, um, um, all of those issues 
where you're going to be, where you think that you acquired this, so you can get an idea of all the causality. So accessibility, for some reason, is being kept away from the population. And I think that data should be as accessible as possible without breaching privacy, because uh, the more that researchers, academics, um, mappers uh, have, the better they can sell the story. Uh, because um, you can, when you can show a story, you can tell it really well. So, um, Ori, do you want to take up the issue of of those and other points? Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. And I, I think Mary Louise really framed it nicely. And uh, as she said, you know, lack of and I will just specify that. Um, so first, I will start with lack of accessibility. If we talk about lack of accessibility, some really nice, some really great example for that would be um, maybe um, some of you have seen that recently the ABS, the Australian Brute Statistics, released really nice net stories, essentially platform that shows this media as well as just data that shows the risk versus weight for uh, maybe uh, world elderly people, uh, maybe uh, TIFA indices and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I thought it was actually a really nice initiative, but I also had some criticism uh, about that. And the criticism was that it was a really great way to view the data. However, the data was not extractable. So that means they didn't use any open format such as uh, WFS, WMS, or even uh, open standard APIs, which is a very standard thing in any open source portals like Transport Insta, for instance, or uh, or even Orient. Um, uh, so, so, that, so that's for me a mix of opportunity. It's obviously great intention, but it's a mix of opportunity because what other developers, researchers, and academics could could do with that uh, is really would have taken us to the next uh, to the next step, if, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's in terms of accessibility. Um, I guess in terms of granularity, and I think, again, uh, Mary Louise uh, say uh, quite correctly, is really we need to maintain that very gentle balance between uh, the wish to access to data, which is uh, as much as granular as possible, uh, versus obviously our legal liability to maintain privacy and confidentiality. So I guess it raised really a debate, which, by the way, started many years before this pandemic, uh, you know, where, where this line uh, stands, or where this line, and I think we are still in that debate. Uh, I guess the pandemic helped in, in the sense that uh, urban, urban planners, health planners, decision makers need really good uh, access to data. And uh, if you're looking on of what was available, you can see that mostly it was uh, around either postcode or local government areas, if I'm giving the example of uh, Victoria, for instance. However, how SA2 level? Why SA2 level, you ask? Uh, the reason for that is that SA2 is one of the most richest uh, um, ABS geographical units in terms of data aggregation, geographical aggregation, uh, and that enables us better than comparison with other measures, such as CIFA, such as other socioeconomical measures, uh, which would have made a lot of sense, which uh, would have ha added a lot of value. So, so that's my point in terms of granularity. Now, the third point which I want to add is really lack of unity. And, and Mary Louise really uh, gave that really great example of University of Sydney dashboard and, and uh, John Hopkins, there's some others as well. And, and that's also the, the issue. So there's a lot of different initiatives, a lot of dashboards. Uh, I actually developed a few dashboards which was uh, in a way the equivalent of John Hopkins dashboard, which by the way started as a PhD project. Um, so I haven't seen any attempt to uh, develop a dashboard that will be both uh, you know, useful for decision makers within let's say New South Wales or other health agencies, and also an attempt to make this as transparent as possible for the public. Uh, and and I, I guess this is something that we, we need to take from here forward, think about one more. how trustworthiness our maps, how authoritative they are, uh, to what extent we provide the metadata and the information that supports support that. Who is actually behind these maps? Um, 
Amy Griffin provided really nice let, um, article about trustworthiness of maps. So I think all of these are really important elements uh, that will form the, you know, the debate as, as we go uh, beyond the pandemic and into the post-pandemic phase. Thank you, Ari. Um, and so that really leads really nicely into the question from um, from Professor Zlatanova from uh, from the university, and it relates to um, the the granularity of data um, and how um, potentially other questions can be answered. And she's she's asked, would it be useful to have um, a, th a third dimension to what is often a two a two dimensional representation of data? Um, can, is, is mapping in the vertical direction, especially, especially in high-rise buildings, useful um, at that level of disaggregation? Yeah. I think um, Ori will uh, talk to this as well, but just from an epidemiologist perspective, um, uh, in Hong Kong, they have, um, they actually tell you where uh, the outbreak is, uh, which high-rise building, because all the buildings are high-rise, uh, and whether the building is an aged care, uh, long-term care facility. Uh, so you have an idea of um, exactly the place uh, on the map where these places are. So they go directly into not just um, AS1, but <laughs> the address, the location. Uh, that's how seriously they take it. So uh, it is it is difficult. Uh, you couldn't do it uh, in uh, residential areas because we don't want people to feel shamed that they're infected. But we all know if they're infected or at a hotel quarantine because they're with they're staying there. So we, but there's this fine line. But certainly, high rise buildings have problems, and they have problems with airflow <clears throat> change and. Um, it seems like often hospital engineers aren't getting on with the uh, with the program and realizing that airflow change is incredibly important for reducing the spread of COVID indoors. Um, so yeah, you could you could do that. Um, uh, I think I think though it would be you couldn't be able to locate the infections, how many infections there were per high rise because of the anonymity, but we probably have to uh, do it by, you know, um, block, you know, uh, AS1. Uh, that's probably as far as we could go. Ori, what do you think for this particular uh, uh, health issue? I, I think it's really, it's a really great point. And the example from Hong Kong is, is, is awesome because um, what what's really was unique in Hong Kong uh, dashboard is that the data not only was provided on a you know more granular level, which was the building level, uh, but also they used 3D. Uh, I don't know if it was Physium or some other software to really present the data in in a, in a 3D, so people could kind of fly in, fly out into areas and see you know see uh, see this as a web scene. Um, you know, get a better perspective where are the clusters. But but I, I have one point to add to that because I think it's a really great question. Uh, so about three years ago, I published a paper. I actually was trying to share my screen, but I can't. Uh, but I will share this paper later in the chat. Uh, so I developed a paper which was focused on injuries uh, by heavy vehicle in Western Australia. And one of the maps that appeared on that paper uh, later on was part of the Met Stories uh, competition uh, by Esri, um, um, was actually used 3D elements. There were essentially two layers. One layer was showing whether there was consistent hotspot or sporadic hotspot or, or new hotspots, and that was just a matter of you know, different colors and symbology. However, there was another map which was having, which had 3D elements, and each bin, so imagine that there's a 3D bin and all of this is extruded. And um, uh, each of these beans, each, each of these boxes were representing different time. And uh, the color, such as, let's say, gray or red, was uh, representing whether it was statistically significant or non-statistically significant. And each of them was representing different time because it was uh, uh, aggregation of 10 years time. Uh, so definitely on that, uh, example, and too, I'm too sorry that I cannot share that map, which is appear on my other screen now, uh, is really uh, was very helpful to understand. Let's say there's a new hotspot or consistent hotspot, 
um, you know, the differences are along the time dimension. So definitely, I think 3D uh, dimension and 3D symbology in map can definitely enhance our understanding. Thank you, Ori. So we've got, um, we're coming to the close of our time, unfortunately, but um, we do have two further questions and probably a time enough to quickly address them. Um, firstly, Jack um, has asked, do you think it's feasible to release obscured space-time data and maintain de-identification, such as mobile phone location data um, and so on? Um, so, um, uh, and that, um, that map's just come up that was being discussed also by uh, Ori, just to say, but um, for those of you on the call. But firstly, uh, Jack's question. Um, so do you think that's possible to actually maintain de-identification, particularly with aggregation of data such as pinpoint location and other features? Thank you. Well, I'll just start with this one very briefly and Ori can take over because I'd love to answer the question about sewerage testing. Um, very briefly, WHO, uh, reminds us that whatever we do, it has to be within the context of ethics. And every time um, something like an app comes up uh, for contact tracing, for example, uh, you have to think about what are the ethical implications, who owns the data, where are the data being stored. So I'll now hand over to Ori uh, for this little tricky question. You know, it's a really good question, and I think it's very, very topical. I think there is a way to balance between, you know, our attempts to maintain privacy and confidentiality uh, and, and, and also that parallel attempts or efforts to, you know, to aggregate data. Uh, I think there's been a lot of work on that before the pandemic. Uh, but but I think what the pandemic done in the, in the context of this question is really uh, it's amplified in a way how important it is. So it is uh, probably equally important to maintain privacy and to make sure that data is not, you know, it's de-identifiable uh, and, and still, yes, still get to that balance where data could be used for, for you know, in a robust level for spatial analysis. Um, to tell you that, you know, we are having the solution in hand, I wouldn't say that, but I've seen a lot of research and progress, uh, some of them some work that I've seen a few years ago from ANU. Um, Around around that, and, and I think this 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 debate in the research domain will will continue. So so I guess it is to be advised in in a way, and it, it is still work in progress, but it's uh, nonetheless extremely important. Yeah, can I just add one other thing, David, uh, to what Ori said? Is that in China, for example, they do use it, and um, it's all about how each community views privacy and how serious they take the idea of prevention. And we in Australia are um, getting used to the idea of the seriousness of COVID. And when it, we first started, China unreasonably was criticized for draconian uh, public health approach, but in outbreak management, it's all pretty draconian. Uh, we've been using lockdown and ring fencing since I don't know, um, Justinian's plague and 500 and something yes. uh, before, after the common era. So really it's, uh, it's how uh, the community are prepared to lose some confidentiality, at, uh, but be given more uh, updated information and allowing the authorities to put to bed immediately a potential uh, cluster. Thank you. So moving uh, on to uh, our final question, which is about sewage water. Um, so um, Mary Louise, I think the uh, question speaks for itself. Um, what do you think? Yes. Oh, well, Ori and I have worked together since uh, 2017, uh, looking at sewage water uh, mapping around the Greater Sydney area, uh, antibiotic resistance for four path human pathogens and the amount of antibiotic use uh, in this. And it's a very, um, uh, wastewater epidemiology is new uh, for Australia, although we also work with uh, the group from the UQ, uh, the lovely Jake O'Brien, and he helps do some work for us, but he also works for um, looking at uh, drug use and other biomarkers using wastewater. When it comes to COVID, it's very tricky because uh, what you find is not all, always active. It, you can be over the infection, but you're still excreting uh, the virus. So 
wastewater is used for uh, in in its entire in with every indicator that you have, and that is clinical test results, contact tracing, the epidemiology, um, and it helps to identify. Uh, because it could be an old infection, a current infection, somebody out of hotel quarantine or quarantine station, and they are excreting a virus, but it is uh, not uh, infectious. And so it, somebody might go for a drive when we're not in lockdown. It could appear as if it's in a barrel, but apparently uh, when they found it in Barrel, which is outside of Sydney, in the country area, in the regional area, it what they they were was given an early warning for the Department of Health, which is great. So what they can do, and also you know visits, you know people visiting who are in the early phase. Um, so and of course we can identify antigen from people at practically day zero, day one, day two, day three, four, five before. Uh, symptoms arise. So it, it's very sensitive, but it can give a good idea for the Department of Health about where to rush to do testing. Yeah. So that's what it's mostly good for. Yeah. And the other good thing is when it's not there and all of a sudden it's there. Thank you. That's excellent. So unfortunately that uh, concludes our allocated time for this session. It sounds like um, um, we've got a lot of people who are interested on in the call. Um, we do have to bring this to a close. Um, I'd like to um, thank um, our uh, panelists, Mary Louise McClaws from the School of Population Health and, and Ori um, from uh, the Faculty of, um, of from Built Environment and, and the School of Population Health. And um, it's been very interesting. I wish we had more time because I think we could go on for hours on this particular <laughs> um, and, um, and I thank everyone for, for joining the session. Um, the uh, picture of that particular um, uh, diagram that uh, Ori was mentioning has been posted to the chat um, and I'm sure we can distribute the link to that particular article um, through um, through the organisers of the uh, conference in due course. Uh, thanks Ori for that. Thank you. I will do it, yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks everyone for your attention. It's a pleasure to have you all. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.